and what kind of God that God would be. How many of you have ever shied away from a conversation with somebody about God because you were afraid that they might ask a question you couldn't answer? I know I have. How many of us would be comfortable if someone asked us suddenly, tell me about your faith. What do you believe and why do you believe it? Would you feel ready to go with your answer? We live in a post Christian culture, and that means we live in a world that is ripe with opportunities for us to do the very thing that God has called us into being as a church to do, and that is to tell people the good news, the truth that has shaped our lives, sometimes reshapes our lives, that gives us hope and peace and joy. Our families, our neighborhoods, our communities, all have in them people who are wondering, is there even a God? Does that God care about me? Can I be forgiven? Is there such a thing as truth in capital letters, you know, truth that is eternal and for all time? What happens when I die? We have people all around us that are wondering those questions. And what I'm hoping is that this series will give us all the confidence to be bearers of good news that we are called to be. But I also think that very few people of faith go through their entire lives without experiencing doubt. So if that is the place where you find yourself, I hope that this series will answer some of the questions that maybe you have been struggling with for a while. So we start at the beginning. Is there a God? Yeah. As far as the existence of God, there are really two arguments that have been made for thousands of years and that have stood the test of time. And the first argument comes from nature itself. It's what I was talking about with the children. In our call to worship, I read, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. When we look at the universe, we see patterns that bear witness to the laws of physics and mathematics and artistry that direct us to see the handiwork of God. And you're going to have to imagine I had a really cool picture of deep space as seen by the Hubble telescope. But you know, you, look, you can Google that online, deep space. Hubble telescope and the pictures come up and what you have to understand is that when you look at that picture it looks like pictures of a starry sky but when you look at that picture every one of those dots of lights is actually a galaxy just like ours and that just begins to give you an idea of the immensity of creation we can step out into our backyards and we can witness the heavens how many of you have looked at the Milky Way in your lifetime and have seen that band of just millions, millions of dots of lights right there? How do you look at that? How do you try to imagine the immensity and the complexity of that and not somehow in your soul say, my God, my God, how majestic is your name? And beyond the complexity of nature, there is the sheer extravagance in nature, in the beauty that we see in nature that points me toward believing that there certainly is a divine being that is a creator. You think of the, the thousands of animals, the thousands of varieties of plants. I just read the other day that, that um, it, was, it was on one of these things that came up, all these things you were taught in school that now are no longer taught in school. And they, there's, there's no longer seven classification systems of creation. There are more than ten that they are discovering. It's amazing, the extravagance in creation. And I walk sometimes out into a field, and it is full, full of wildflowers. And I think, who even sees this? Who even sees this? The extravagance, it almost seems wasteful sometimes, because it's just there. It's just poured out everywhere in creation, the beauty of the changing leaves. I mean, was all of that necessary? Was all of the color and the variety necessary? Or does that just point us toward the extreme? 
extravagance of the God who created it. For thousands of years, long before the psalmist wrote those words that we heard, and long after we are done singing God's praises, people have looked up, and they will look up. People have looked around them, and they will look around them. And they will see the beauty that surrounds us every day, and they have felt and they will feel the need to thank someone, to praise someone, because what they are seeing is the handiwork of God. The traditional Orthodox belief in the church is that God created all that is ex nihilo, which means out of nothing. The first four words of our Bible point us to that. In the beginning, God. The first chapter of Genesis is poetry. It is a liturgy of praise to the God from whom all things have come. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, it's interesting that many physicists and biologists, along with this author, describe the beginning of life in much the same way. Out of nothing, something amazing, something incredibly complex, something extravagant, all that is, came into being. But we believe that God is more than just a divine source, more than just an intelligence, a master mathematician. We believe that God is personal and wants to be known by us and wants to be in relationship with us. Before we get to maker of heaven and earth, when we say the Apostles' Creed, we first say, I believe in God, the Father Almighty. It's a relationship. Is the first thing that we say about God. I believe in a relational God. There was a time when the people were enslaved in Egypt. And God saw their misery, and God came to the wilderness to a man named Moses. And God called Moses to be the one who would deliver God's people from bondage. You all know this story. You remember this story. And Moses notices this bush that is burning, but is not being burnt up. And the voice says to Moses, take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground. And a conversation ensues. And finally, Moses says to God, what God are you? He says, and the question is, what is your name? And what does God answer? I am who I am. In other words, I am existence itself. Everything that exists came out of me. Over and over again in the Bible, we see that God isn't some dark force some impersonal pulse of energy, or some distant intelligence, we have the maker of everything that is having a conversation with a certain man in a certain place, in a certain time. Because this God is concerned about God's people. Paul Tillich said God is the ground of, all our, is the ground of our being, our personhood, comes from the personhood of God. Our ability to love comes out of the love of God. And I believe that we can know this deep down within ourselves, within our knower, because we experience that love that comes from outside ourselves. We experience a love that we know we didn't manufacture on our own. I may have already told you this story before, I don't remember, but if so, I'm telling it again. Because this is one of the most important memories that I have in my life. I was working as a social worker in Kentucky, and together with a therapist, I made a home visit with a family who had a two-year-old that was profoundly disabled after falling headfirst into a mop bucket full of water and cleaner when he was just 13 months old. And we were sitting in the living room, and we were talking about what kinds of services this family needed as they were trying to keep this uh, beloved child at home with them. And all of a sudden, in the middle of our conversation, the mom got up, and she walked out of the living room, and she came back, and she was carrying this baby, her son. And there were tubes, you know, as in my memory, there were just tubes everywhere coming out of this child. And she said, Here's Jerry, would you like to hold him? And she just plopped him in my lap. And as she did that, I had 
the strongest impression. I don't often hear words from God, but I have this impression that I couldn't shake, and it was, take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground. And suddenly, it was just like the entire living room filled up with a presence. And I don't even have words to describe it. I can only tell you what I felt. And I was so shaken that as we left that house, I said to the therapist, did you feel anything unusual? Did you see anything that happened there? I felt lots and lots of disabled babies. And I had never had an experience like this. <coughs> I said as we got into the car, I think that little boy is dying. And the therapist said, I don't think so. We didn't see anything to base that on. I mean, I mean, he's, he's certainly disabled. He's certainly health. His health is compromised, but he didn't look to me like he was dying. Two days later, I got a phone call. When that therapist had gone to the house and picked up that baby, he had gone into cardiac arrest and died. That moment changed my understanding of death. Before that, I believed that death was this thing that we had to walk through alone. But that experience was so powerful, it convinced me that we are not alone when we die. God is there to meet us. God and the angels take us from this life to the next. I am convinced of that. God loves us all the way through to the other side. Is there a God? Sometimes I think, um, well, I'll say this. Sometimes God doesn't make it all that easy to believe in God. You know, prayers go unanswered, and we wonder, what is happening? Sometimes bad things happen, sometimes to really good people, and we wonder, what is happening? And sometimes, we in the church haven't made it so easy to believe in God. And I have talked to a lot of people who have the impression that you pretty much have to park your brain in the door if you want to go into church and believe in God. But that is not true, and there are a whole host of really, really smart people who have come to believe that there has to be a God. Fred Hoyle, one of the leading astronomers in the 20th century, and also a self-proclaimed atheist, whose fellow atheists are really doubting his atheism by some of the comments that he has made. <laughs> but he said that the chances of everything in our universe coming out of nothing, the chances of this happening are about the same as a hurricane sweeping through a junkyard and leaving in its way a fully a fully built jumbo jet. <coughs> and another time he said, the chances of all of the necessary elements lining up in order for life to happen accidentally are about 10 to the 40,000th power. I don't even know how many zeros that is, but I know it's a lot of zeros. <coughs> That's a huge, a huge accident. He even went so far as to say it is difficult to figure out how life on this planet could have happened without some form of intelligence behind it. Can you see why his fellow atheists are doubting his atheism? Francis Collins was head of the Human Genome Project. He is one of the world's leading scientists working at the cutting edge of DNA. And he wrote a book about his work, and he called it The Language of God. Dr. Collins found faith in God and became a Christian as a result of his scientific studies. Max Planck, who originated quantum theory, at a speech near the end of his life said this, all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force which brings the particle of an atom to vibration and holds this most minute solar system of the atom together. We must assume that behind this force, the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. George Lamontre first proposed, the, he, was, he was the one who first proposed the Big Bang Theory. He was a scientist and a priest. He didn't see science and faith as being in opposition to each other, but he saw them as work that goes hand in hand. John Hookinghorn taught math for 13 years at Cambridge before he heard the call to priesthood. And then he went on to teach math and physics and theology at Cambridge and has written some of the best books we have on faith and science. Alan Sandage, one of the foremost astronomers of the 20th century said, everything I have learned in my life has led me to the conclusion that there is a God, and he chose to follow Jesus Christ. 
Now, I say all this to say that belief in God does not preclude a serious study of science. And science does not preclude a belief in God. Some pretty smart people have had their studies lead them to a belief in God. And I believe that they have become Christians because they don't want that God to be some impersonal intelligence. They want that God to be relational. And they find that in Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I can look at a snowflake or several snowflakes and see the uniqueness and the beauty of each one of them. I can imagine my own DNA in all of its complexity, and I see God. I believe that there are I am vibrations pulsing throughout our universe. That is God. That is the matrix that holds everything together. But even more importantly to me, I see and experience joy. And I have to ask myself, without a God, where does that joy come from? Because sometimes it's not circumstantial. Sometimes there is a joy that goes beyond all the circumstances in my life. I understand guilt, and I have to ask, where would that guilt come from? Without there being a moral code actually built into the universe in which we live. I feel hope in the midst of pain, and I believe there is a God. I don't know how else to explain these things. How else do we explain love without God? And what I know, what I am sure of, and what I have chosen to believe, and because of that, I find meaning not only in my life, but in the smallest to the largest acts of kindness and grace, is that there is a God, and that God loves me, and that God loves you, and that God is not only extravagant and complex and immense and magnificent, that God is right here. And I know that I am a better person than I would be otherwise for believing that. So we can look around at all of creation and we can say there is evidence here. There is more than enough evidence to justify belief in God. And we can look at our own experience and those times when we have heard or felt God in our own lives. We can look at who we are as people because of our belief in God. All of those things we are more than capable of talking about with anyone who asks us, what do you believe and why do you believe it? These are ours. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you for the witness that you have left us. The handprints that we see throughout creation the handprint that you have left on our hearts, the handprint that you have left on lives that have been given and devoted to you. And we pray that as we consider why we believe what we believe, that you would firm those beliefs within us, that you would quicken us, that we are ready at any given moment to be able to share the good news of our belief with anyone out there who is searching and who is asking questions. Is there a God and does that God love me? Let us be able to say with a resounding yes. As Jesus taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven,